There's not a more appropriate study for what we are dealing with in our country, really, than the book of Jeremiah. Of course, you've heard me say uh, before, and, and Dan and I have shared this burden as we have worked together over the past 15 plus years trying to see an awakening and a revival in America, is, you know, God does his greatest work when the hour is darkest, and certainly things have been dark uh, and getting darker. And we have been commissioned to occupy until the Lord comes. So we've got to be busy about his business until the trumpet sounds, which could be very soon. But until then, we have our marching orders. We don't know whether we are going to be like Micah, who was preaching. And quite frankly, Isaiah saw it all, uh, preaching and teaching through the reign of bad kings and ushering in a Hezekiah and see a great revival sweep the land. Or if we're going to be like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, with his passionate patriotism and being one of the most holy men in all Scripture. In fact, uh, you know, when, when the disciples were, were, were con conversing with Jesus at uh, Caesarea uh, Philippi and said, uh, you know, whom do men say that I am? Uh, one of the answers, well, some think that you're Jeremiah. So imagine, you know, just what kind of a man Jeremiah must have been if there was a, uh, a, a, an assumption that Jesus might have been Jeremiah risen back from the dead. But Jeremiah was passionately warning uh, his city, his country, his government, uh, his, the preachers of the day, uh, that repentance was necessary, otherwise that judgment was coming. And quite frankly, those that opposed him, those that were his enemy, those that he did battle with were his own countrymen, uh, people from, we would say, your own party, uh, the pastors, and the political leaders. And of course, as a result, you know, he had a, uh, what we would consider, was it a successful ministry? Well, he did exactly what God called him to do, so it was successful. But as far as the results that we would like to see, you know, it was not successful. And not only that, but he preached passionately and warned of the judgment that was coming and then had to endure the judgment that God poured out upon Jerusalem as, as he was in the most dire of conditions when the city was surrounded and they were undergoing the siege. Not only was Jer Jeremiah inside the city, but much of the time he was in a prison inside the city because the people, his own people, hated him so much because he had the audacity to preach the truth. Now, he is considered one of the four major prophets. Well, quite frankly, any of the prophets are equal and, and major in God's eyes. But as students of the Bible, we have classified uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel as the four major prophets. As I said a moment ago, he was a very righteous man, but also a devoted patriot uh, to his country and to his uh, capital city of Jerusalem. Uh, and all in all, he preached for over 40 years. And again, uh, I, you would consider it a largely fruitless ministry. You know, I, I, I would probably say that our ministry has been fruitless, but that would not be fair because we have had, uh, constant, we, we, there have been effects of this church literally around the country. In fact, we had someone come in to visit with us that runs a, a counseling program that now operates in four different states. It's a, it's a very large ministry now, uh, wanting to uh, you know, obviously share about uh, the work, and many members of our congregation actually are involved in this. And, of course, uh, considering our, our church would be considering some financial support. But I didn't realize until they were sitting in my office that their whole ministry was birthed out of our church. The man that started their ministry actually at, at one time had an addiction problem himself and came and sat in my office, and we were able to help him and get him started in the right direction. And not only did he recover, but this whole counseling ministry that reaches across four states. So our church has some fingerprints over a lot of things, and the Lord has chosen to work through this little congregation. However, you know, as a pastor, you'd like to see 
you know, a 5,000 seat auditorium filled twice on Sunday mornings and that kind of an outreach. But uh, the reality is uh, that that is not how you measure success. It's up to God to measure the success. One of these days at the, at the uh, judgment seat of Christ, we'll find out how successful you know, we really have been. But again, from what we would consider success, you would say that Jeremiah's ministry was not a great success, but it was. And we've got much that we will enjoy and learn from it. Tonight we will get started after we pray. We'll do a little introductory uh, background and then we will cover, we're going to try to cover the first 10 verses and then we'll pick up from there. Well, let's live a little bit of background so you know where everything fits in. I always like to, well, I'm not having success with the clicker, so we'll just do it by hand. Uh, oh, well, there's a reason we don't have the clicker stuck in here. All right. Yeah, yeah. You know, technology works better when you use it right. Uh, well, first of all, remember Abraham called out of Ur the Chaldees. After the flood, a man went back to his previous behavior, but God was not going to judge the world by water this time. God spoke to this man in Ur and said, follow me and I will make you a great nation. In fact, you're going to influence many nations. And of course, Abraham went somewhere around. Now, these dates that are up here are just to kind of get an idea. We don't know the exact time. But somewhere around 2000 AD, or excuse me, 2000 BC, Abraham was called from Ur of the Chaldees and went to what we call the Promised Land. Approximately 1900 BC, as Abraham uh, had Isaac, and then Isaac had Jacob and Esau, and of course, through Jacob, he had 12 sons. The young, or actually the 11th, was Joseph. Of course, we know the story of Joseph being uh, hated by his brothers and beaten up and sold into bondage in Egypt and how God eventually elevated him to the number two man in the entire planet. And then through Joseph, uh, the, his descendants, all 70 of them at that time, came into Egypt just as God had told Father Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 that his kin would be uh, enslaved in a strange land for some 400 plus years. And of course, that's exactly what did happen. We know that in about 1500 BC, Moses led the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt through great miracles. The ten uh, poured out upon Egypt and of course the crossing of the Red Sea to cap it off and the destruction of the most powerful military in the planet at that time. We know that 40 years later after wandering in the wilderness, uh, Moses' job, his tour of duty was finished. And Joshua led these two million or so Jews into the promised land and over a period of seven years took possession of what God had given them. And of course, they had divided the land by lot into 12 states or 12 tribes. And then for the next 400 years, they were operating as God had designed under the rule of law, supposed to be choosing out from among them capable men that feared God loved truth, and hated covetousness. It was not a strong central government. They didn't have a standing army. They had a militia throughout the 12 tribes. They blew the shofar in times of crisis, and the men would come and be there to defend the people. But the elders were supposed to judge righteously according to the law. This was, in fact, a republic, a constitutional republic, just as our country was modeled after. We know that about 1060, the people sought to disobey God. And as they were disobeying God, there was more uh, consequences of that disobedience. And as Benjamin Franklin said, as man becomes more corrupt, he has greater need of more and many masters. And that's what the people wanted. They wanted big government to take care of all their problems. They wanted to have a king just like all the other nations. So God gave them the desire of their heart, which was a big, strapping, strong, tall, self-willed man named Saul. But after 40 years, God said, enough of that, and God gave them a man after his own heart, this little shepherd boy from Bethlehem. And then David ruled for 40 years. Seven years, he just ruled Judah. And then for 33 years, he ruled all 12 tribes. And it was during that transition that you all have heard us use the term the sons of Issachar. Well, the sons of Issachar, the tribe of Issachar, about 200 in total, had discernment of the political will and the, the, the right direction for the people to go. And after that seven-year period, there was, a, there was a question as to whether the, the 11 tribes would follow another son of Saul or whether they would consolidate and follow David. Well, those sons of Issachar had tremendous influence, and of course the 12 tribes were once again united in following King David. We know that King David's son Solomon took the throne at the high watermark for the nation of Israel. 
But midway through his rule, he married foreign wives and began following foreign gods and allowing all sorts of idolatry. And because of that, God uh, divided the kingdom after his death. Uh, geographically, with 12 geographical tribes, excuse me, 10 geographical tribes to the north, and that was called Israel, and two geographical tribes to the south, that was called Judah. And from thence, the God or the religion of the Judas became the Jews, and that's where we come the term of the, of the Jewish religion when we speak about it uh, glibly. But there were no lost 10 tribes at the time of that separation. Those that wanted to follow Yahweh from the northern ten states came south. Those that were pagans went north, so there were never any lost tribes. It's just geographic. If Oklahoma was, no, it would be more like Texas. If Texas went pagan and Oklahoma was holy and righteous, then those holy and righteous in Texas, if there were any, maybe Rick Scarborough and Robert Jeffers, that's about it. No. Uh, well, they might move to Oklahoma. And if we had pagans like Dan Fisher, Dan might move to Texas. But um, anyway, Dan's in the back room. I, he's hearing this, so I'm not just taking a shot behind his back, although I would, but I'm actually taking it in his front right now. So anyway, so there were nowhere any lost tribes. But there was just a geographical separation, of course, with Jeroboam being the first king to the north and Rehoboam also being in the lineage of David ruling in the south. We know that the northern kingdom immediately went off into apostasy. Of course, they had the golden uh, calf up in Dan and a golden calf uh, down south, and, and they weren't allowed to go back to Jerusalem for the high holy days. They had nothing but pagan kings. We know that in the south they went through periods of spirituality and periods of paganism, depending upon who the king was. We know that eventually God had sent prophets to the north and prophets to the south and had given warning. Finally, in 722, with the expansion of the Assyrian Empire, they captured the northern kingdom and they were no longer self-governing. They were part of the Assyrian Empire. And then they made a press further south and actually had surrounded Jerusalem during the reign of King Hezekiah. And of course, it was at that period of time that they were mocking outside the walls and said, you're going to fall. Your God is no different than any of the other pagan gods. And they gave a letter of surrender with the terms and everything. Hezekiah took it in before the, the Holy of Holies and laid the letter out and said, God, you've got a problem. They're defaming you. This is your issue, Lord. What are you going to do about it? And I get great comfort from this because the Scripture says that God dispatched one angel. In one angel and one night, the custom was what would typically happen is they would sneak into a camp and kill every other soldier. So the Scripture doesn't say this, but you can insinuate a possibility is that of the Assyrian army, I love the way the King James puts it, 185,000 of them woke up dead the next day. Well, guess what? They fled. They went back. And actually, Sennacherib wound up being killed uh, shortly after that. But God delivered uh, Hezekiah and delivered Jerusalem. But here's the thing. You remember when Jesus was in Gethsemane the night of his arrest? And Peter jerked out his sword. And Jesus said, no, 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 put it away. Put it back in its sheath. He said, don't give it to the government. Don't turn it in. You keep your sword. But now is not the time to use it. And he put the ear back on, uh, oh, good grief, the, uh, the uh, associate uh, of the high priest. Uh, and, then, and he said this, don't you know that I could call down 12 legions of angels right now if I needed to, at the snap of a finger? Well, if a legion is approximately 7,000, that's approximately 84,000 angels. Now, considering what kind of damage that one angel did to the Assyrian army, I'm not at all worried when I recognize that there's 84,000 ready for dispatch up there at this point in time, anytime the Lord wants to send them. You know, when you wake up and you recognize that Colossians 1 says that not only did the Lord Jesus create everything, but by His power all things are sustained. So when you wake up and you realize that your body is still held together, that scientific law is still in force, then we recognize that Jesus is still on the throne. He hasn't gone on vacation. He hasn't taken a nap. 
Even if an idiot like Joe Biden is running for office, Jesus is still aware of the insanity that's going on in this planet, and he's still got it under control. So anyway, the northern kingdom was captured at that point in time. But then, as you transition that next hundred years, as Assyria was the predominant world power and political force up here between the Tigris and the Euphrates River, there were three, well, actually two basic world powers with one up-and-comer. You had Assyria, which was the dominant world power. You had Egypt juxtaposed down here, but clearly the number two in world dominance. But they had their area uh, pretty well secure. Then you had this young up-and-coming nation called Babylon. But over time... Of course, God gave Nineveh that extra century. You remember in reading the book of Jonah, God was about to judge Nineveh for their wickedness, but Jonah finally got there and was preaching repentance, and they did. God wound up giving them about another century. By the way, that's one of the reasons we're doing what we're doing here. I know the rapture's coming, but when the trumpet sounds, I hope that we're still a free constitutional republic able to buy and sell and go on vacation and have freedom and come to church and worship. I really don't want to be in a gulag. I don't want to be facing the firing squad if I can choose not to. But um, there's no guarantees. You know, Fox's Book of Martyrs was written during this age that we are in now, the church age, and some of those grisly atrocities that have ever been perpetrated on a man have been poured out upon Christians. So we have been fortunate to be able to not be exposed to all that. However, it could happen. That doesn't mean that God's gone out of business. It just means that we in America have turned our back on God, and we'll suffer the consequences for it. But in 612, this young upstart nation pushed up and actually captured Nineveh by Nebopolassar, or Nebopolassar, who was the king of Babylon, and his son, the crown prince, Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadrezzar, and then the Assyrians pulled back to Haran, and that was their capital temporarily until 610, when the same forces led by Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadrezzar conquered Haran. That caused a a a a, a upcoming uh, battle, which would determine the future at that point in time, as the Assyrians retreated to the city of Karshemish. And at that same time, the king Pharaoh Necho of Egypt decided to make a power play. And he moved up and joined with the Assyrians at Karshemish to try to withstand and ultimately defeat Babylon. Now, we'll tie all this together. Again, today we're setting the foundation. We'll get through the verse 10 verses, but it's important that you understand. I've got some pictures, and I'll show you this. There's a mountain range just, on, just um, west of... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, just east of the west coast, the Mediterranean coastline. And you can travel up the coast very easily. But then there is a pass going from west to east, just north of Megiddo. And it is there that King Josiah of Judah met and tried to stop Pharaoh Necho from going north. And it was there that King Josiah was killed in battle. Now, that's important because we'll tie it together here in a minute as we do this background. But Pharaoh Necho uh, conquered and took control of Jerusalem and subjugated the king of Jerusalem at that point in time after Josiah's death. We'll talk about that here in a moment. We'll tie these pieces together, and then we'll get into our study. But it's important that you understand what was going on in the world. You know, the Bible makes so much more sense when you understand the context around which the Scripture was written. So Pharaoh Necho goes north up here and joins with the Assyrians at Karshemish. But then in 609, Nebuchadnezzar defeated them. I'm sorry, let me go back here. Nebuchadnezzar defeated them and drove Pharaoh Necho all the way back down into Egypt. As he gets down here, the only thing that stopped him was he had gotten word that his father had died. So now not only was he the crown prince, but he was actually the emperor. So he stopped and turned around and was going back to the capital city to gain control of his empire. On the way, 606, 
He surrounded Jerusalem and took control of Jerusalem. That is when Daniel was taken captive in what's called the first conquest of the city. So with that background, we'll proceed. Family tree for the kings of, of Judah. And the ninth king was a king called Uzziah. He was a good king. Those of you that have done your studies of kings and chronicles will recognize that Uzziah was a very godly king, but late in his... In fact, I think he had the second longest reign of all the kings of Israel. He got uh, very self-confident and arrogant. He actually went into the temple and was himself, as the king, offering incense on the golden altar. The high priest came in and withstood him. Uzziah, rather than repenting, got obstinate, and God struck him with leprosy. For the last 10 plus years of his reign, he was co-regent with his son Jotham, who carried on these very godly policies. So Jotham was not as strong as his father, but was a good king. Now, you re remember reading in Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, Isaiah had his vision, said, in the year that King Uzziah died, okay? So when was that? Could have been two things. It could actually have been the year that Uzziah died, or it could have been the year that he was stricken with leprosy. So basically, he was as good as dead. But it was at that time that Isaiah was called to ministry. So understand that Isaiah was ministering at this period of time along with Micah during the reign of Jotham, during the reign of wicked King Ahaz. Ahaz was a dirtbag. I mean, if you read what he did and then you read what Manasseh did, I mean, he was child sacrifice. Ahaz actually set up idols. Ahaz actually copied the altar in Damascus that was built for the pagan gods and had a copy of it built in the court of the temple of Yahweh. It was that far off track. It was during his period of time that Isaiah went and went head to head with him. And we got the prophecy of Isaiah 7, 14, that Jesus or the Messiah would be born of a virgin, that, that um, uh, his name would be Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and the government would rest upon his shoulders, upon the throne of his father David, eternally. So all of that was during the reign of Ahaz as Isaiah was dealing with him. Next was Hezekiah. Of course, we talked about that great revival a little while ago that Micah and Isaiah certainly played a part in and what we certainly hope we see here. It was during Hezekiah's reign that the Assyrians circled the city. And the story I told you about a moment ago where 185 of the Assyrians woke up dead the next day. Well, Hezekiah was given a death sentence. He was sick. Isaiah came and saw him and said, the Lord said, your time is up. Get your affairs in order. Make sure and sign that DNR. Get your, uh, get your estate planning set up and, and be ready to go. And Hezekiah, it said, wept like a baby. And God answered his prayer and gave him 16 more years. Bad news is, is he made some bad decisions in that 16 years. One was having sex with his wife because they had a baby named Manasseh who was not born if he had died when he was supposed to die. Instead, he had Manasseh, who was the worst king in all Israel. You know, you've probably never been with a pastor before that uses the word crap in the pulpit and uses the word sex during the Bible study. Oh, well. Uh, anyway, we just tell it like it is around here. Um, uh, and then Hezekiah, in his stupidity and arrogance, allowed um, an embassy from Babylon to come down, and he showed him his treasury. Well, word got back, and of course it didn't take long. Once, once Nebuchadnezzar was in power, he knew exactly where, where to go to. But anyway, after Hezekiah, you have Manasseh. Manasseh is recorded as being the worst king in all of Israel. Idolatry, child sacrifice, everything. Midway through his reign, or at least partway through his reign, he was taken captive by the Assyrians. And during that period of time, he repented. And he was serious. When God smiled upon him, showed mercy on him, he was released, he came back, and he changed everything that was going on in Judah at that period of time. However, uh, the length of time, we don't know. I, I was looking on some, uh, doing some Jewish research. One of the uh, Jewish websites said that he was 22 years a bad king, 33 years a good king. 
I didn't realize that, I, I didn't have it in my mind that he was a good king for that long. Perhaps he was. Nevertheless, bad king early on, grossly bad, repented, turned things around. Well, when he died, his son Ammon came to the throne, and his son reinstituted all of the idolatry and all of the wickedness of his dad's earlier reign. But now all of those counselors that had been there during Manasseh's righteous reign saw what Ammon was doing and decided to veto it. And they assassinated him after two years, which led to Josiah taking the throne at the age of eight. He was a godly young man, and at the age of eight didn't try to change anything, but reinstituted the right things that were going on at the tail end of Manasseh. So remember, let's say Chabad.org is correct, and Manasseh was spiritual for 33 years. Well, he had a lot of godly counselors that were set aside by Ammon. When Josiah came to reign at the age of eight, he reinstituted these godly counselors. The scripture tells us that at the age of 16, he began following the Lord in all earnestness of himself. And as now a young adult, he was a very spiritually minded young man. The scripture says that at the age of 26, he began to refurbish the temple and get it fixed back up. And it was during this period of time that they discovered the law in some storeroom. And they brought it to Josiah. And Josiah had them read the law to him. And Josiah was grieved and rent his garments. And he was truly repentant. And he said, will God forgive us? So that question was posed. And the prophetess Hulda was who they went and asked. By the way, when I've shown you pictures of Jerusalem from the model city, the southern trajectory going up the steps, there's two sets of gates. Those are called the Hulda gates in honor of this very godly uh, woman. But she told them that no. Judgment is certain. God is going to judge Judah for her wickedness. However, it will not happen during Josiah's lifetime. As long as he is alive, they'll be spared. Now, I shared with you a moment ago how Josiah went up to try to confront Pharaoh Necho at 609 when he was making that power play, and he was killed. Well, immediately after his death, the Jews instituted Jehoahaz, his son, as their king. When Pharaoh Necho came into town, he took Jehoahaz captive because basically there were two political parties involved here, just like we do. God, just like what Isaiah was saying, God was saying, turn to me, ask me for help. But in Jerusalem, you had one faction that was saying, we need to appeal to the Babylonians. You had the other faction saying, we need to appeal to the Egyptians. So everybody was political pragmatists, but nobody was saying, let's repent, other than Isaiah and Jeremiah, nobody was saying, let's just trust God. Let's just repent and do it God's way. Well, Jehoahaz was one of those of the party that was leaning towards the Babylonians. Well, once Pharaoh Necho came to town, guess who was ushered out of office? Jehoahaz. He was taken captive back to Egypt, spent the rest of his life there, died there. Necho replaced him with King Jehoiakim, who reigned 11 years. Now, this is important because, again, remember, it was midway through this, we'll talk about it, when Jeremiah's ministry began. So these kings you need to know about. Jehoiakim, after he died, was replaced by his son, Jehoiachin. But they had rebelled against Babylon. Babylon came back down in 597 and circled the city, took it captive again, and took Jehoiachin as their prisoner and replaced him with his uncle named Zedekiah. Zedekiah, who was in charge through much of what we will be studying in Jeremiah, basically much of what we will be studying is during the reigns of these guys. Early part will be during the reign of Josiah, and we'll talk about that. We'll distinguish each of those as we go. Now, just so you'll know, these guys were all contemporaries. The city was captured three times, and 606 is when Nebuchadnezzar first took control of it, took Daniel back as his prisoner. Of course, you know the story of Daniel working with inside the palace. 597, after this tributary stopped paying taxes, 
Nebuchadnezzar came back down to take control again. This time there was not a long siege. The city quickly surrendered, and Ezekiel and about 5,000 middle class, upper middle class tradesmen were taken back captive. And Ezekiel ministered in a city, a, a refugee city called Chibar, actually on the Chibar River. It's called Tel Aviv. That was the original Tel Aviv, about 50 miles south of Babylon. And then in 587, finally Nebuchadnezzar came back and destroyed the city and destroyed the temple. Jeremiah was ministering for these four decades inside Jerusalem. Daniel was ministering inside the palace. Ezekiel was ministering to the Jews in captivity. So with that said, let's get into our study. We'll hit about 10 verses and we'll stop. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anna. Now, by the way, are you all up to date? You understand what's going on? Do we need to go through this again? You will be tested. The priests that were in Anathoth. So Jeremiah was a Levite. His family was of the priesthood. As a matter of fact, he was of the lineage of Abiathar. If you remember, who was a sole survivor of the priests of Nob. Boy, you just got to be a Bible junkie to enjoy our Bible studies. I guarantee you the average church member would be going, what are you talking about, Willis? You remember when Saul was after David, and David fled, and David was in Nob, and the priest there helped him, gave him and his men some bread, and then gave him Goliath's sword. Where Saul showed up a few days later, accused those priests of being traitors, and had an Edomite kill them all. Well, one escaped. His name was Abiathar. He joined up with David and served with David as David was, was running from Saul and then ultimately when David came to power and served in Jerusalem. However, when David died, Abiathar was on the wrong side of who the next king should be. He had sided with David's son, Adonijah. Now, quick pop quiz, who was to be the next king to follow David? Solomon, exactly right. Well, once Solomon came to power... Because of how good Abiathar had been to David, Solomon didn't kill him. However, he did retire him from the priesthood, and he lived in Anathoth. That was his home. This little community, actually kind of a suburb. It's three miles northeast of Jerusalem. So that is where Jeremiah's hometown, that is his lineage. He was of the son of Hilkiah. Now, Hilkiah is going to be a rock star in just a few years, but not yet when Jeremiah was first called into ministry. Because it would be Hilkiah that discovered the law when they were renovating the temple. And it was Hilkiah that brings the law to Josiah. And of course, I already told you about what had happened before that or after that. So the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in the Levitical city of Anathoth, in the state of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his 30-year reign. Now remember, Josiah took the throne at age 8. In the 8th year of his reign, he personally sought the Lord for himself. In the 12th year of his reign, he destroyed the idols and the high places. In the 16th year, he began the renovations of the temple. Well, what we just read here in the second verse is that in the 13th year of his reign, Jeremiah received this call into ministry. So Jeremiah would actually serve through the reigns of five different kings, but two of them only reigned for three months, so they're basically footnotes. But what's interesting is that jo Jeremiah began his ministry calling Judah to repent in a period of time that we would look back at and say, they had repented. They had a good king. In fact, they were only 13 years into the 30-year reign of Josiah. Logically, we would think that they were still on the uptick. They haven't even begun renovating the temple yet. Repent from what? Things are good. Well, obviously, God can see our heart and not see the superficialities of the outside. And although there was much on the outside that seemed to be going in the right direction, 
idolatry was still ingrained in the hearts of most of those in Judah. As a matter of fact, we will see when we get there in just a few chapters that where Jeremiah begins his ministry is not in the bars and brothels. It's in the gates of the temple. And he goes to preach repent. Now imagine. We would logically think if we're going to see repentance, we would want to go to where there's obvious sin. We wouldn't go to the doors of first so-and-so church. Or pick the name. I mean, there, there are names all over the place now. I don't want to use one because I don't want to offend anybody, so I better not pick one. Because pretty much any kind of trendy name is part of a church name somewhere. But us church. And that's where he was sent to go and preach repentance. So it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So this is the extent of his ministry, beginning in the 13th year of Josiah, going all the way down until the city was captured. Then... The word of the Lord. So in the 13th year of Josiah, gets this call. Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew what I was going to call you to do. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I had set you aside, and I ordained you to be a prophet unto not just Jerusalem, because we're going to find that obviously he's dealing with Judah primarily, but he also deals with Babylon, Moab, Edom, and some of these other nations that were surrounding. Boy, did God have a very specific will for Jeremiah. Does he have a specific will for us? Amen. I think so. We know that he's got general will, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, that you may know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do we know what God's will is? Come ask me. I'll tell you. No, I'm just kidding. In the Bible. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your... How do you trust the Lord? I guarantee... Well, I know what Proverbs say. What was the book of Proverbs? Solomon giving instruction to his son. You want to trust the Lord? Obey him. If I said, um, uh, Brother Matt, I'm going to tell you about a good restaurant. Once you get out here on I-35 and go south into Oklahoma City, get off on 36, go across, turn in Twin Hills, great place. You know what? If you trust me, you're going to say, okay, great. And you're going to get on I-35 and go south, get off on 36, go, and you're, that is trusting. If you say, I trust you, Pastor, and then you go down to Taco Mayo, you're really not trusting me. You're listening, or you're acting like you're listening, but you're not. So trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge me in all your ways. I will direct your paths. So God does give us instruction. What is some of God's general will? Well, God's general will is he doesn't want anybody to go to hell. 2 Peter 3.9 says, God is not slack. Concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but as long-suffering. Why? Because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance through Christ Jesus. But it's up to us. God's desire is that we go to heaven, but he's not going to force us to accept Christ. That's up to us. God's general will. Uh, Lord, I want to find a wife. Okay, here's your instructions. She's got to be a woman. According to Scripture. And I don't want you to be unequally yoked together, believers and unbelievers. Okay, well, that's pretty clear. Now, you go shopping from there. And I'll tell you what, if you trust me on these generalities, then I'm going to lead you to just the right one. That's how God works. Now, for Jeremiah, there was a very specific will. God says here, Jeremiah, I have created you to do this job. This does not mean that we existed before uh, uh, the, uh, our parents conceived. We did not exist prior to that. Jesus was the only eternal Son of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have a beginning, an origin, when life begins. However, before Jeremiah ever came into existence, 
God, who is not bound by time, knew what he needed to have done and knew who he was going to create to do it. And then, Jeremiah, I created you to do this job. I knew what needed to be done before it was even, before you were even a twinkle in your daddy's eye. And I was creating you before you were formed in the womb. I had ordained you to be my spokesman unto the nations, the Goyim, the Gentile nations as well. Then said I, <laughs> Lord, <laughs> I can't do that. I I'm too young and inexperienced. I'm not qualified. You know what? I love these men that get called to some job that don't want it, that don't aspire to it. You know, too many of these guys that aspire to office or to aspire to some calling, generally, they're probably not the right choice because they've got personal motivation. You know, you look at Scripture, Moses. God called Moses to this great work. And what was Moses' response? Well, it's about time the pulpit search committee found me. I'm just the man for this job. No. He said, I'm too old. I'm just a shepherd. I don't speak well. Oh, God, call somebody else. But Moses was God's man. Consider Jonah. Jonah's called. <laughs> I love Jonah. No, God, I don't want to go preach to them. I want them to die and go to hell. I am not going. I'm going the other direction. Well, eventually God convinced Jonah. <laughs> Ezekiel. You know, Ezekiel was another priest. You know, he's sitting there and he's like many of us. He was upset at the situation that he was in. If he had been back in Jerusalem, there he would have been at the age of 30, the great honor of serving in the temple of Almighty God. Instead, he was in bondage in this refugee city 50 miles south of Babylon. And he was chapped. He was hot about it. And God called him to this ministry, and he didn't want any part of it. And then God convinced him as well. His eyes were opened, and he saw the importance of the job that called him to do. Jeremiah said, I'm too young and inexperienced. One of the reasons that I took comfort when God called me to pastor. Folks, I didn't want to be a pastor. My father was a bivocational pastor. I love pastors. But I'd seen the work. I didn't want any part of it. And uh, quite frankly, just like that, didn't feel like I was qualified. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I'm so bold. I've been trying to get fired for 20 years. <laughs> but it's one of those situations you know I just said God I'm not capable you know it was very clear we're not going to the story we're going to wrap this up but it was like okay Lord if you're in this you're capable I'm not I'm willing to, to be the foot soldier and I got to tell you I think we've got the greatest church in any church I've ever been around do you know of any pastor whose ego was so out of the picture that he would bring in a co-pastor to work with him and enjoy it. I don't know of another church in the country that could do what we're doing. But you know what? You couple, I got a couple old sled dogs here that just want to see God glorified. They just want to, just want to win. By the way, we have the question, the Lord said unto me, say not that you're too young for this job. I am going with you, and I'm, gonna, I'm sending you, and don't worry, I'm going to tell you what you need to say. What I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces. Have you ever heard the phrase, face off or facing the crowd? God says, don't fear the crowd. Don't be afraid of their dirty looks. Don't be afraid of their negative responses. I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Now, folks, let me tell you, we're going to get into this, and we're going to find out that that's not all that Jeremiah was expecting. Is it, Miss Judy? When you serve the Lord and get diagnosed with cancer for the, what, the third time? Second time, okay? Let me tell you, 
Okay, Lord, I don't want to be a pastor. I'm serving you. We're doing the job. Doing the Okay, you want us to do what and where? Florida. I don't understand how this works. Okay, whatever you say, Lord, uh, the doors seem to be opening. Here we go. We're going full string ahead. Okay, what? I've got what? Throat cancer. Really? Lord, did you, are you taking the day off? It's not always as you envision it. And Jeremiah, <laughs> is it, Brother Paul? Okay, I think everybody could give a, a hearty amen to that. God always provides. Hey, you know what? There's a point in time. In fact, we'll get there. Well, Jeremiah sits here and says, God, you lied to me. Woo! I don't judge that because I've thought it. I've probably said it in the silence of my own home. You guys have probably said it too, if you're honest. But uh, so it wasn't this easy ride that Jeremiah might have been expecting. However, he was reassured that God was going to deliver him, and not to worry about the opposition. He says, I have put my words in your mouth. Quick story. Uh, of course, my first funeral I ever did was dad's. And I know Uncle Walters was up there, one of the first ones, my granddad's. But early on, I was asked to do a funeral for a business associate that we had had in our vending and coffee business. And the man, uh, you know, I'll not use his name. I do not believe that he was a believer in my interactions with him. I have no reason to believe. And I was asked to co-officiate this funeral. And I am a Baptist minister of a, at the time, a more staunch, independent Baptist church. <laughs> Baptist church that would fire a guy that wore blue jeans and a shirt like this to church. Um, but anyway... Uh, I was going to co-officiate this service with a Catholic priest. Now, that's an interesting situation for a young minister. I wasn't a young man, but I was a young minister. And, you know, I don't intentionally want to offend anyone. I really don't. I mean, I don't want to make people feel uncomfortable or awkward. Uh, and I was kind of wrestling with, oh, my goodness, how am I going to go to this? You know, I've got, some, I've got some Catholic friends that I know are born again. However, if you follow the strict direction of the Roman Catholic Church, it's a works-based salvation. And they've got things in there like, um, oh, uh, where is it you go when you uh, die? Uh, uh, purgatory. And things in there that just aren't in Scripture. And I'm sitting there going, boy, I've been asked to co-officiate this. I'm going to get up and share the stage with it. Boy, this could get uncomfortable. And uh, I, I, I visited with an a, a, uh, older minister at the time, a man that had been in ministry for many years, and he gave me some great advice that I've, I've adhered to. In fact, I adhered to it prior, but it was just good to hear it. He said this. He said, Paul, you just preach the word. Let him disagree with it. You just preach the word of God and let others disagree with it. Folks, that's all the foundation we've got. Jeremiah was told by God, I have put my words. Hey, here, let me get, here, I'll give you what you need here. Let me get touch your, touch, okay. I've given you, I've put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set thee over nations and over kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. He is literally prophesying. Jeremiah will be prophesying and warning different nations, different kings, different governments, primarily, is, primarily Judah, but also some of the surrounding nations, and even Babylon. We get into chapter 50 and 51. It definitely takes Babylon to task. He's telling them about coming judgments. And in some case, like Israel, their promise to be replanted in the land and be rebuilt in the land. But one of the things... The last thing I want to take note of as we, as we stop at this point and we close our, our service tonight is notice that two-thirds of this is critical in correcting and reproving, and one-third of it is instructive and encouraging. Now, what's the, what's the current trendy methodology of, of churches? We want to make you feel good. Preach whatever feels good, all self-help stuff, all power of positive thinking. 
I thought it was interesting that Jeremiah's command was two-thirds of it was critical or correcting error. One-third of it was positive and rebuilding. And then I thought, it's interesting that the New Testament has the exact same ratio. As Paul is getting ready to face the executioner's sword and he is encouraging and reminding and commissioning his young protege, Timothy, what God has called him to do. He said, preach the word, be ready all the time, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Two-thirds of it are corrective. One-third of it is positive with all long-suffering and doctrine. You think we are missing something in the modern American church? We no longer will call sin, sin. It's now a lifestyle or an alternate lifestyle, and we want to help that lifestyle to flourish. We no longer talk about hell and judgment and eternity and consequences for our actions. We're all victims, Marxism, quite frankly, victims of our circumstances. It's not your fault. You're not a drunk. You're an alcoholic. You're not a pedophile. You have a minor um, affection disorder. Minor attraction disorder, I think. No, you're not. You're a pedophile. You're wicked. Your sinful nature is taken over, and you're going in the wrong direction. You know what the kindest thing somebody could say to somebody that's going in the wrong direction? Turn around. It's not loving to sit there and watch somebody have a miserable life, struggling with sin that no doubt whether they want to admit it or not, you know from personal experience is crushing them on the inside. And then one day when they die, they're going to spend eternity separated from God. Are you telling me that's love to let somebody continue going down that path? No, it's not. Is it love to watch your, your one-year-old uh, wander over towards the stove and you say, oh, and he's going to put his hand on the burner. Oh, there he goes. Well, he'll learn his lesson in a minute. Well, I love him too much to tell him no. Of course not. As a loving parent, you're going to yell at him and holler at him and tell him to turn around. It's not a lack of love, that's a demonstration of love. So one of the areas where we have gone off track in modern American Christianity is this one right here. You know what? My mom loved me enough to beat the devil out of me. And at one time, pastors loved their congregations enough to call sin, sin, and tell them to, to the old turn or burn. Repent or else. Now we're so loving we just let them go on in their own misery and heading to that ultimate destination. All right, we're going to stop right there at verse 10. We'll pick up in verse 11, kind of transitions into a little bit of a new section. But uh, I love this book. It's been a long time since I've taught it here. But um, I know we are going to thoroughly enjoy it. I hope you enjoyed tonight. Tonight was a lot of background laying the uh, a political landscape and the historical landscape. You know, as a, as a young, young man growing up in a church, I heard all sorts of Bible stories, but I had no idea how they all fit together. Reality is, you know, the Bible is one progressive revelation from left to right. It's so important and so much more understandable when you understand the whole historical context and the whole context of the situation that's being talked about, whether it be Paul's letter to the Galatians or the record of Jeremiah uh, dealing with the kings of Israel. So I hope that you enjoyed the background. We got through 10 verses. We'll pick up there next week.